Good morning, everybody. Uh, so morning. today, as we said, this is the Brookline Bees from the Brookline Senior Center. And we're going to talk about things that we can do at home during the coronavirus challenges. And one of the things we always have something to do is to work on some mending. So I, we brought some slides today and we have a special guest, my sister, Margaret Smith, who is in Memphis and that's her husband, her technical support guy, Grayson. Hi. Hi. <laughs> and we have Claire and we have Millicent Hi. with us this morning as well. And I think other people will be joining, so we'll deal with that as we go along. So just to get us started, I put together a couple of slides to talk about mending in general. Come on, no, we need to, whoops. It covers it up, so it's fooling me. All right, got it. Okay, so let's look at a couple slides. Whenever we talk about mending, we have to think first about what we're trying to do. And there are three different kinds of fabrics. There's knitted fabrics or woven fabrics. Mm -hmm. And then the most complicated, of course, is lace. And we'll talk about all three of those in the course of today and next week. <clears throat> Some of it we'll do next week. But just think for a minute, if there's a hole in your fabric, what happened? Why is there a hole? Well, we, what we've done is we've disconnected the threads. If you look at the red yarn line here that in a piece of knitted fabric, you can see that we've disconnected the red lines in a number of places, not just one or two, but several places. And if we don't get those fastened up, it's going to get worse. Uh, it'll unravel both horizontally and vertically. It'll unravel. You've seen that happen in a sweater. And, and with a woven fabric, the same thing happens. We've disconnected those threads. And how are we going to make that better? And glory be in lace, there's even more complexity. So I want you to think about when you have a mending challenge in front of you, what are the goals of the mending? First of all, we want to keep that tear from getting any worse. We want to make the fabric look good and get that garment or quilt back in service and make sure it survives the wash if it's going to be washed. And there may be some other special considerations. One of the the things that I like to do is to look at the challenges. First of all, what kind of a fabric is it? We talked about that before. And where is the stress? So is this at the knee, at the elbow, at the waist, or and under the arm? They're, they're, the fabric is going to get stretched and stressed in different ways as you use it. And why did it tear? First of all, maybe it's too small. Maybe you need a little bit more fabric around the shoulder or in the waist. And how visible? Is it on the front of the shirt or is it on the tail of the shirt? And you're going to approach it a little differently if it's going to be highly visible. Another consideration is how comfortable does it need to be? Um, when you're patching it, particularly in socks, if it's going to be in the shoe, if you have a rough spot in, in your sock, it'll rub and create a sore on your foot, right? So you need to think about comfort as well. And could you just plain patch it? Bronwyn sent me some pictures. Um, I'm sorry she hasn't arrived yet, but um, this is her blouse and it's a, a pet blouse of hers uh, that she really loves. And so she wanted to get this back in service. Oh, sorry to be late. Hi. Oh, well, you're just in time. We're talking about your blouse here. And, oh, great. Uh, and just to let you know, we are recording this session. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so here's her blouse, and this is where it's ripped. You can see her finger there, so you get some idea of proportion. And you can see that the fabric has been pretty much destroyed. So getting this garment back in service and getting to the point where she can wear it and it'll survive the wash is going to be challenging. So one of the things she 
thought of is where could I get some more fabric that looks exactly like this? And one possibility was to take off the little cap sleeves and use this fabric to reinforce some of the others. And so we'll talk about that as we go along. But even though this blouse, I think we'll see that there are very similar challenges um, in the things that Margaret's going to show you of the work that she does. Uh, so again, Bronwyn's trying to figure out what to do exactly with this blouse. And Margaret has brought us some samples of the mending that she does. And just to let you know, she has a really nice website. It's called dreamstitcher.net from Methods. Today. Oh, I'll write that down. Dreamstitcher.net. Right. Okay. So there's Margaret. Uh, Margaret, you go ahead and I'll drive your slides when you want. <laughs> okay. I, um, I can't see which slides you're showing right now. So I'm, I'm showing your face right now. Okay. So shall I go to the slides? Yeah, go ahead and go to the slides. Okay. Just, there it is. Share the screen. Pick the slides. There you go. Okay. So here's your, your, um, um, here's the sleeve. I do a lot of lace repair on antique clothing. This was a dress that a girl brought to me and it had all these small little holes in it that you can see. And so it's a challenge to then try to repair these dresses so that they're again wearable um, and close the holes so of course the holes don't get any bigger. So the next slide shows the after, that's the before, and the next slide choice will show the after of this same thing. Right, and I'm just going to mute everybody except Margaret um and uh just so that uh we don't have a lot of crosstalk okay and we'll go back to our slides in one second okay. there you go. next slide yeah that's the before and you can see the little holes and then the uh, next slide yep one second because i'm for some reason it's not advancing so easily so I just have to, uh, maybe I can, can I do that? Um, or, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, a little technical difficulty here. Next slide, slideshow. Let's try it that way. Uh, no, slideshow. And there. This is okay. the... This is this is the after, and I've closed all those little holes. It's a matter of taking a, a single strand of thread and a needle and just very carefully by hand sewing the little holes closed. You can see um, a couple of them. You can see the actual repair where I had to go in and reweave the lace a little bit to, um, to close the hole because the, the lace is literally gone from some of the places if the holes are too big. But again, it becomes a wearable garment as opposed to an unwearable garment. And so that's the goal. It's like, what is our goal here? And it's to make it usable again. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Joyce. Okay. Well. <laughs> It'll get there. Yeah. Mm, all right. Uh, pardon me one second while I figure this out. Again, what I sent Joyce for slides that show a before and then an after of what the garments look like. A lot of things are antique dresses. And so they're um, basically, if they pack the dress away with any kind of starch in the lace and Memphis uh, area is very humid and we have a lot of so if they pack it in an attic and they haven't taken all the starch out of it you'll see little round holes in the lace and that's where the um, bugs bite it 
and try to get the, the starch out of the lace. If it's a lateral rip like this one, it's a wear Hang on one second. hole. Yeah. So this particular one is at the bottom of a dress. And yeah. uh, did, you, did you phone in? It's literally been ripped. And so I had to take it in again very carefully, one strand of thread and a needle, and put the lace back together. So the, the next slide will show it it's repaired. Can you go to the next slide? Yes, just one. For okay. some reason, I can't get this to advance properly. Uh, oh, wait a minute. That's not the one we want. We're up to here. Here we go. Try that one. Are you seeing it now? No, not the next one. Can you go to the next one? Come on. It's, it's paused the sharing for some reason. Uh, let me try again. Okay. Yes, there it is. And if you look very closely, so, you can see the line of the repair toward the bottom, sort of at the right, and at the upper left, um, sort of a little past midpoint on the left side. But again, it takes it from an unwearable format where it was ripped to now it's a wearable format. And when you see this on somebody, you're not gonna be able to look in and see this exact repair. So it just takes these dresses and make them wearable again. And that's the ultimate goal. We have two high schools that graduate their girls instead of in cap and gown, they graduate them in these vintage looking dresses. And so I often get the old dresses to repair that were grandmothers or mothers, or sometimes I have to make new dresses that look like old dresses. And so that's what I've been working on this year, even though it looks like graduation might be on hold for a while down here. So um, go ahead and do the next slide if you would. Go, go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, this particular one, obviously had somebody stepped on it and ripped it, the fabric away from the lace. And again, you take a single strand of thread and a needle and very carefully, <laughs> stitch by stitch, put it back together. And so the next slide will show the finished piece. And there it is with it completely finished. Um, so again, it becomes a wearable garment again, as opposed to a non-wearable garment. Okay, go ahead to the next one. This was the top of a sleeve, and this is a very different kind of repair. Um, again, these holes are not wearable as they are in this garment. This is the sleeve of a graduation dress. And so I had to try to replicate the, the uh, net effect of the um, sleeve and make it wearable so it's not gonna continue to rip. So the next slide will show it repaired. Next one, yeah. And, um, you know, because of the nature of the 
uh, area, you can see the little teeny repair places. But when it's on a girl and she's busy and she's moving and she's talking, you're not gonna zero in on it like you would if you saw huge holes. Now you're gonna see the same effect of the uh, pattern that was there before. And so it doesn't immediately draw your eye to the, the uh, hole or the repair. So that was the goal on this one. Okay, go to the next one. I didn't send her very many slides. I just sent a few. <laughs> okay, this was a table um, doily that someone brought me and said, oh, this was my grandmother's. Is there any way you can make this usable again? And so um, with that big hole, obviously it's gonna draw your attention. And then I had to make it usable again and not draw your attention. So um, go to the next slide. And there it is repaired. Again, you can see where, um, you know, any trained eye can see where the repair is. If somebody says, oh, I had to re repair this, then you might look for the uh, repair. But just to glance at it on a table, you're never going to notice it. So, okay, go to the next one. This again was in an antique dress. And as you can see, it had a couple little holes in the lace. One um, sort of in the upper right part, which was actually a hole in the lace. And then down a little bit below that, uh, one place where it had ripped apart from the fabric and then also in the lace itself. So I had to repair this one. And the now finished item is the next slide. and there it is fixed. Again, when it's on somebody, you're never gonna zero in on it. If somebody said to me, oh, there's a repair, yes, I can find it, but it's not gonna draw your attention like a hole would. Okay, next. This one, it was down the front of a christening gown and um, it presented a totally different kind of a challenge because I had to make it look like the design that was already there. So when I get into these lace repairs, I often don't even know what I'm gonna be getting into at the time um, because they just are so different so often. So I had to reweave this one to make it look like it was the same design as, as originally had been there. So go to the next slide. Sorry, that's fine. Uh, here it is. Here's <laughs> next slide. Sorry. <laughs> and there it is repaired. And again, you know, it's not quite the same as the original, but it's a whole lot better than the whole was. And so the next slide will show the completed christening gown. And when these are on an active child, nobody's gonna notice it, I promise. <laughs> and that's the completed christening gown. Now it's ready to wear and be uh, back to its original form again. Okay. This one was brought to me just recently, obviously an incredibly active child. She was climbing a tree in this dress and not only ripped the lace from the fabric, but also ripped the lace itself. So I had to first go in and try to put the lace back together and then go across and do the finished piece. This was more than 12 inches across. 
And so that was the front of the dress. And then as I discovered, she also ripped the back of the dress. So this one is the front and the next one will show the front finished. Sorry for the lag time here. Uh, this one. So that's the front of the dress back together again. And, it, and you can kind of, you know, see a little bit. I told the girl, I said, you know, part of this lace is really missing, but I'll do the best I can. And so again, it's now wearable. And then the next two slides will show the back of the dress before and after. This is the back of the dress and it had one larger hole and then it had a smaller one. And then off to the right, there's even a rip in the lace itself at the bottom of the dress. So as I check these dresses before I return them to the owner, they'll say, oh, here, fix this one hole. And it's like, yeah, but before I give it back, I check all the holes. And so this is the back of the dress when I discovered those other couple of holes. And so this is now repaired again. Again, you work with a single strand of thread, very fine and a very tiny needle and just laboriously work stitch by stitch. Okay, try the next one. You know, um, this might be a good place to just ask if anybody has any questions. So I've unmuted all the line if anybody has a question. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, on the one that looked like netting, uh, yeah. it, uh, I don't know, I don't seem to have my picture up. I don't know how to do it. Anyway, the one that looks like netting, it looks like you use string or did you use a single strand of thread and kind of do a chain stitch to make it? I did use a single strand of thread and I, but I did run it multiple times and then kind of do an over stitch over it along the length to kind of hold those different strands together and just kind of block them together so that it made it thick enough to be like the original. Did you um, wrap it? Did you wrap the strands? Because they look thicker than it's the It's not really wrapped, but it's kind of a lock stitch and then you carry it down and then you lock it again and carry it down. Um, over the thread. Over the th oh, or I'd love to threads. I'd love to meet you and see how you do that kind of stuff. Because I have tried you know something. Air lace I want to say something. This is really Millicent. Uh, <laughs> Mill Millicent, wait one minute until Bronwyn's finished, and then you can talk. Well, next time I, I get I, to Boston, uh, yeah, I'd love to meet we'll you. Have because to... I've tried to repair lace, and I don't know how to do it. And it seems like it's halfway crochet, but with so, a needle. It depends on what the lace design is. Um, because it, like these different pictures show all kinds of different laces. And so some of them are much easier to repair than others. The ones that are more open are harder to repair because you don't have as much to work with. Um, what I get into antique fabric repairs, I often will use a tiny piece of tool behind them because the fabric is so delicate like I've been working on a dress that was made in 1825. Wow. And so the Man. fabric is so delicate that you can't stitch to it without the fabric itself ripping again. Right. And so I'll put a little piece of tool behind it, just a tiny little piece, and then use that to work my stitches in through as well as the fabric. Yeah, and I thought I noticed tool fabric. a couple of places on the right. first ones. Yeah. Yeah. So the tool will give Very you that added back um, that stability without giving any thickness to the look. Right. So yeah. Very interesting. I'd love to meet you. Yeah. Well, one <laughs> of the groups coming up, and I think it's going to be the last group, is a dress that was from, um, it was a 125-year-old dress from France. And the mother had bought it, and the daughter wanted it to be worn by her flower girl in her wedding. But it had all kinds of worn out batik. 
And so when that group comes up, I'll talk a little bit more about it. I think the next group might be a tablecloth that somebody brought me. Um, can you put up the next picture, Joyce? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Technical difficulties. Yes. But she's doing better than I would, so that's why I sent the pictures to her. <laughs> she's doing much better than I would ever do. <laughs> I can fix lace. I can't work a computer. <laughs> May I say something now? Yes. What would you like to say? Did she sew, was she, did she sew that lace on a, on a sew machine back and forth? Like you sewed it? And then you push the reverse button and you sew it again, let go of the reverse button? No, I do all my lace repairs by hand. No sewing machine. I think it would stay better if you, it could stay good too if you did that on a sewing machine too. I know I have a reverse button on my sewing machine and I do that when I'm sewing pants at the seat. If I'm doing something that is um, a fabric repair and it, um, the stitching's not going to matter, I will sometimes do it on a machine, but on these lace repairs, they're going to be visible. And so you've got to replicate what the lace pattern was. And if I use my sewing machine, I can't replicate the lace design. And the sewing machine but would you rip the antique back and forth book. about three times? Well, did and the lace... back and forth three times? But the laces my are hand. so delicate, a lot of times the machine is too <sighs> strong for them. And, um, but, but by hand, by hand, by hand, did you sew forward and then you sew back, then you sew forward again by hand about three times? No, I'm doing it just one time, yeah. very carefully, well, one tiny little let, stitch let at a time. Go ahead. So, Joyce just mm -hmm. off. She got kicked out of her own voice. <laughs> this is Joyce. Here, Joyce, I'm going to put your speaker on. Joyce. Is he talking to me? Oh. Is he talking to me? Jo Joyce is having technical problems on her end. <laughs> Joyce is... Mm -hmm. Joyce's internet got kicked out twerking on her street. Oh no. Uh -oh. <laughs> hi, Bronwyn. Hi, Bronwyn. How are you, Millicent? Hi, hi, Bronwyn. Did you see that message I left you about that um that message about the the, the phone the phone thing with but my body with that man, body mighty Sanders, Mr. Sanders. Uh, you know, Willis, Sanders. I don't think this is appropriate for this meeting, but I, I did see the message, but I'm not supporting Bernie Sanders. So I didn't join the Zoom meeting for Bernie Sanders. I'm a sort supporter of Joe Biden. But this is this is not a uh, part of our session. We should be listening to Joyce's sister, who's an expert expert seamstress, and we need to listen to her. So about the lace, huh? Yeah, about she's, the lace. she's really expert. We need to listen to her because we can learn a lot from her. Mm -hmm. So since Joyce has gotten kicked off and, and we can't get the other slides up right now, one of the things that I do mostly is I do graduation dresses. And so this is, um, like I said, these two schools graduate the girls in these vintage looking dresses. Hello, and if I... they have a dress in their family, then I make a dress that looks like vintage. So this particular one has all lace front and goes down. It's so pretty. And again, all the way down to the very bottom. Here, oh, here. Is this a, a religious the school? One, the next one, because it's got embroidery on it. It's Batiste and lace, and it's all cotton. The Batiste is, if you think of most of what you guys work with for quilting is broadcloth. The next thing thinner than broadcloth is called lawn. And it's, um, it's this kind of thickness. It's a little bit thinner than broadcloth. And then the next thing thinner than lawn is Batiste. And it gets even thinner. And so this is another one of the graduation dresses. And it has tiny little embroidery. Oh, it's beautiful. 
Is this a religious school or, or like a school um, of seems? One of them is and one is not. Oh. One is just a private school and one is a private <laughs> religious school. Um, it's really neat that they graduate in these antique dresses. It's been a tradition for over 150 years and they simply haven't changed the tradition. And wow. so the kindergarten girls are flower girls to the senior girls who have, are the graduates. And so they walk down the aisle in tandem with their little flower girl beside them up for graduation. It is absolutely beautiful to see all it these. Sounds, it sounds like a really interesting tradition. I'd love to see it. And all the dresses are different. They just have to be all white or barely off-white. So a lot of times wow. I will off-white laces on white fabric because if you work with white lace on white fabric you don't see the pattern of the lace nearly as much as you do if it's um slightly off color and so well I if you come to boston i want to show you some antique clothes that i have this one you can see the the lace is just slightly off white right right so that you can actually see the pattern of it a little but um, now I think we have Joyce back, so maybe we can get back. Thank you. And Millicent, did you get your question asked? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you. So I'm going to mute everybody again, except Margaret, and we'll go on to your tablecloth, okay? Uh, and Erickson Road, unmute. And here is Margaret's tablecloth. Whoops. Okay, this one was a a four yard long tablecloth that had belonged to this woman's grandmother. And she had sent it to the cleaners after she used it to have it cleaned and pressed and rolled it all up and packed it away. And two years later, pulled it out to use for a special occasion to discover that the cleaners had absolutely caught the lace in one of their machines and ripped the lace and never told her about it. And because it had now been two years, she couldn't go back to the cleaners and say, oh, you ruined my lace. And they go, oh, well, yeah, right, lady. And so she brought it to me and said, well, what do I do? Well, a few of the places I could actually put the lace back together, but then this large chunk in the center, the lace was literally gone. And so I had to go into, I have a box of antique lace remnants that I bought from the daughter of a woman who used to own a shop. And so there are a lot of just bits and pieces of lace. And so I went through my box trying to find something that had that back filigree look of the same lace to patch in. So go to the next slide and I'll show you what I ended up doing. Um, the, la the lady came and she knew that I had fixed it and I said, okay, find a repair. She couldn't find it. And I said, then, that, then that's all I wanted. If you can't find it knowing that it's there, somebody who sits down at the table will never see it. But in the bottom center, you can see that it's not quite the same lace pattern, but it's the same background pattern. And so I was able to patch that in and repair her lace that way. So again, it took an unusable tablecloth and made it now usable again. So, okay, try the next one. This one was a pillow, little child's pillowcase cover and the hem stitching in the four corners was ripping loose. And so she brought it to me and said, help. And so the next slide will show what I was able to do with it. And the main thing is you want to keep these rips from continuing to rip. And so I reproduced the hem stitching effect in these four corners and was able to stop it from continuing to rip. And now she can use it again. So, okay, next. This was the dress that was a a 125 year old dress from France. And the old Batiste is much thinner than the new Batiste. So before I went too far with it, I told her, I said, I'm gonna fix one panel, which is what's in the center front. 
and you can see it's slightly darker in color. And the one to the left is the one that had holes. And the, just about every one of these panels had these wear holes in the old Batiste. So I showed her this one and I said, this is what I can do. Tell me if you like it. If you do, I'll continue. Because once you put a slip under this dress and you put it on an active child, you'll not see the dish difference in the uh, old Batiste and the new Batiste and the thickness of the two. And um, so she liked it. So go to the next slide. And, and I think I have a couple of slides that show the progress of this dress. You can see that there were holes in bigger areas, holes in little areas. And I had to absolutely put the fabric into these areas without destroying where the lace had been. And um, it, it was a challenge, but I'm always kind of up for a good challenge. And so you can see the old Batiste is on the left with the holes. The new Batiste is on the right, slightly thicker. But again, the dress was totally unwearable as it had been. And then it progressed to wearable. So these are pieces that I had cut out and pieces that I had replaced above. You can see it's slightly different color um, than the original Batiste. But now the dress is complete, and I think I have a picture of the whole dress. And that's a close-up. And then the, I think the next one will show the entire dress finished. But some of them were the big pieces. Some of them were holes in the little pieces. And it, it took a while. It was a challenge. <laughs> And that's the complete address. So she was able to put it on a little girl and have it in her wedding. And of course, when you put a slip under, you're not gonna see the, the color difference between the old and the new Batiste. And it's on a child. Like my grandmother used to say, if you can't see it on a galloping horse, it's pretty good. So. Great, so I'm gonna unmute the lines if anybody has any questions. Yeah, any questions about that one? Yes. I'm that that last one was beautiful and i was going to ask if you actually removed pieces but then you explained it with the picture that you did actually remove pieces i guess very carefully very so carefully. that you could put in new pieces without destroying the other ones i actually put the new pieces in first and then remove and then remove the old piece very carefully with tiny little sharp scissors um, because I had to keep that same lace shape that was there. Right. And I couldn't think and you of didn't want it different. that shape if I took out the piece before I put the new it piece. It would stretch. So, yeah. Yeah. So, right. I, I, very, I actually very interesting. had the two layers together and then took the old layer out. Right. It looks beautiful. Well, thank you. So, Again, I'm thinking it takes it from unwearable to wearable. So. Right, so so Margaret, let's look at Bronwyn's blouse again and see oh, great. what you would suggest for dealing with that because this is, um, I think, a good picture of something very similar to what you were just dealing with with that dress. But now knowing that she has some fabric that looks like this, that she could where, use to patch it. Where on the dress is this rip? Yeah, um, th that's important to know. It's It's the underarm area so it's not right. going to show okay very much unless i raise my hands which i'm not going to do in a sleeveless <laughs> blouse don't go swinging from trees and you'll be okay no um, I I don't start, do that anymore <laughs> i would start and i would um if you've got the extra fabric try to find a piece of fabric that would be the same pattern as this and put it behind it and then I would also reinforce it with a piece of tool behind that new piece of fabric. And then I would stitch very carefully by hand around the edges of the um, hole that is in your fabric through your new fabric and your tool. And that tool is gonna give you the extra stability that you're gonna need to make it hold. So I was, th I was thinking maybe it should have like an interfacing too besides tulle because it's so thin. I wouldn't think so. I would think if you put the new fabric there and you put the tulle, it, it gives you a lot of stability like an interfacing would without giving um, the look of interfacing to conflict with what you're seeing. 
Okay. So you actually I have another question. Ratio. Since it was a, a cap sleeve, and I've very carefully, very carefully removed the sleeves uh, so that I could somehow use the material from the sleeves to fix the underarm holes. Now I have to somehow put an edge on the sleeve. Do you think I should just use like black cotton or probably something like tulle would be better? And uh, not tulle, um, batiste. If I could find black batiste, maybe. It, it's gonna be very hard to find black batiste. You might go online and be able to find it. Um, Batiste is usually white and off-white. Yeah. Um, I think that you could be okay using a cotton edging, or you could even maybe roll an edge. You know how to oh. do a little bitty yeah. roll edge by hand and have right. that finishing. And this is not something I'm I'm going to want to wear a lot because I, first of all, I might I might have gotten too big but in the it. dress to even wear it now. But I think I could wear it because but it's, it's stretchy it, material. It needs to be wearable. Yeah, yeah. If it's something when it's really love, hot, it be wearable. But it's very very thin material. It's thin like it's it's Emmanuel Angaro, a, a, a designer. I bought it at, at a final closing sale at Filene's basement and it was one of those things that probably cost hundreds of dollars oh and yeah I got it for like twenty dollars and the design was so gorgeous and I just hated to throw it away so I'm I appreciate your suggestions for how oh, to yeah. fix it yeah it's a okay. shame it okay. cost a hundred dollars at Filene's basement that's unbelievable it's well, they basement sold usually have clothes. discounts Filene's basement sold designer clothes oh yeah, yeah. And they had wonderful, beautiful designer clothes for, you know, a couple hundred dollars. But mm -hmm. the real price would have been thousands of dollars. Right. And I didn't right. buy a lot of this stuff, obviously. <laughs> I was poor. But I saw this blouse. It cost $25. And I said, I've got to have that blouse. <laughs> it sounds like a good deal. And so I, you, I think you can easily make it usable again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, Margaret, just to summarize, if you would patch something hopefully matching this this pattern find a piece that matches the pattern and stick it behind it behind right. it and instead it, of on top i was going to do on top piece of tool and then would you cut out this raggedy part and turn no. the edge no i would not cut any of it out um use your needle and try to reweave this to your new fabric right. and your yeah. tool so that it's going to if you try to cut it out, then it becomes very much visible. If you yeah. don't cut it out, you can hide it much more easily. And it's the kind of thing that I, I really wouldn't be lifting my arms, so I don't think sense? it would show. Right. And I should wear it in an air-conditioned place so I wouldn't sweat. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the problem. These things actually more often than will wear out under the arm because that's where we get the most fabric rubbing against itself but also uh, body oils and sweat um, right those all, holes are from sweat i'm sure we all can't just glow like we're supposed to we do sweat <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> thank you again you're welcome okay joyce you run through those just last couple of slides sure we're done okay I think I have it up. Yes. I think I only have like maybe two left. Yeah, there's two left. Um, my my daughter um, used to cut holes in things somehow. We don't really know how. And so she called me and she goes, Mom, first off, let me just tell you Molly, who is my granddaughter. She's Molly is definitely my daughter. And I was like, oh my gosh, what did she cut? And she goes, well, she cut a hole and I wish I'd taken a picture of just to the left of the zipper. And it's a uh, inverted triangle. And um, so she said, well, she cut a hole in the skirt and it's what she can do. So I said, bring me the skirt. Let me see what I can do. Well, fortunately she had a little piece of fabric. I'm not sure how she had it. Um, from this skirt. And so I patched in this hole right in the middle. Um, move your arrow up just a little bit, Joyce. 
yeah, right in there. And I sent her a picture. This is the picture I sent her on the phone and said, okay, Molly, this is the best I can do. The skirt was not gonna be wearable as it was. And I thought, I'll just do the best I can. And if she can wear it, fine. If she can't, you know, it's, it's where it was before. And Molly loved it and wore it that night. And she said, nobody even noticed. <laughs> But um, I think this one and I think the next one is a little bit closer shot of the same repair. But uh, the important thing on corduroy is be sure that you have the nap of the corduroy going in the same direction if you patch in a piece. So there you right. go, the patch that I patched in. And again, very carefully by hand. And I had to turn the edges of the cut piece under as I put this piece from the back up um and stitched it in place right and then i had to go back and stitch this uh diagonal line back up to make it look like the zipper line because the zipper line had been cut and so right. i wanted that zipper line to still be there so and it looks it. pretty good <laughs> thank you it's wearable <laughs> it's now <laughs> usable where it wasn't before so you you know you just have to be creative when you do these repairs um, you have to think, what am I working for? Am I working for just something that's going to look good? Or am I going to work for something that's wearable? If it's going to be in a stress area? And it's sort of, what is my goal? Um, with my antique dress, the goal is get the dress back into a usable form that the girl can wear. I had a dress a few years ago that was her aunt's had been for graduation. And it had 175 holes in the lace. Oh the whole dress was lace. And so I said, let me just start and see. And I just, and I kept count of the holes, how many holes I was fixing because I'm <laughs> everywhere. And, and uh, so she wore it for graduation. I got it fixed. She wore it for graduation. I said, now a whole bunch of more holes may open up for the next generation. But <laughs> we got this one fixed for this generation. I, I hope you're getting a good amount of money for this kind of work. <laughs> uh, not as much as you would by the hour as you should, but you know, you can only get what the market allows. I had yeah. a dress a few years ago that had been this girl's <clears throat> grandmother's wedding dress and the sleeves had rotted because of course she had sweated. It was a summer wedding in Memphis. And, um, but there was a train and the whole dress was lace. And so I could take the train and remake sleeves. The original sleeves had been long and pointed. And um, so the new sleeves, because the whole dress was lace, I made it just come to the elbow. And then I took tulle and made a tulle ruffle because she already had enough lace on the dress. And I said, we don't need to make another lace to be the ruffle. Let me just put tulle. So I put a tulle ruffle on the sleeve bottom. And then it had had what used to be called a vanishing collar and it was a collar and then there was tulle and then the dress. And so you saw that the collar appeared to be a floating collar and you didn't see the connection. So the graduate did not want that collar. So I took that collar off and brought the dress down to where the original lace of the dress had started and edged it with pearls, tiny little pearls oh, nice. all around to kind of give a finish to that. And so she had no collar, she had this, taken down to the lace and short sleeves that only came to the elbow with ruffle. Um, she wore it to graduation. Her grandmother was there. Her grandmother came out and said, oh, and I love your dress. And then she looked at it and she goes, that's my wedding dress. <laughs> she had no idea when she first saw it that it was the same dress. So I do have now a picture of the grandmother wearing the original wedding dress and the senior wearing the dress as we remade it. Oh, so, that's great. Great story. I never know what kind of a challenge I'm going to get into, um, whether it's repair, whether it's not, whether it's just, you know, change the style. But I, the only, quote, alterations I do are on these vintage dresses. I don't, I don't alter other things. But the vintage dresses are fun to play with. So that's, that's what and I you do. do. You do hand embroidery, right? Do you have examples yeah. of your hand embroidery? 
Um, the only thing I have is um, just the embroidery that I've done on these graduation dresses right now. And I do that with single strand um, embroidery and I draw out my design. Uh, hold on a minute. So if any of you have other challenges that you want to share with the group, we will do more on mending next week. But, yes, I want. I want to. I, I want. I would show if I could, but I make some out of the corduroy material. This beautiful base corduroy material that I made the mask from. I made myself a pair of corduroy pants. Oh, great! You know, the zipper broke. I, I, I the zipper was kind of new, and it broke. After wow. I tried tried the pants on, and what I did, I replaced it with some velcro. So the, the pair closes with velcro and a button okay. at the top. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. I have another pair of corduroy pants I made a long while back. And um, they, they are, I thought they were a purple and brown color at the same time mixed together. But I think it's a very deep purple, these with corduroy pants. And the zipper broke. It was a blue jean zipper that I bought at... Uh, at um, Michael's Arts and Craft store, and, and and the zipper broke on me. It broke. I, you know, it broke, and I couldn't zip it. So I'm, I'm going to replace that one with Velcro too. Okay, sounds great. I see Margaret's organizing some embroidery to show us. I, I think I'll go show them off now. Okay, that'd be great. Show the pair. Okay, what I what I do is when I get these graduation dresses. Um, designed, um, there is no pattern for these at all. And so as I talk to my girls, I sit and I talk about, you know, what would you like? Well, they don't know what they want for a dress. So I, in pencil, I do my little drawing and I start off with, you know, what would you like? I don't know if you're doing this because uh, I really had not made it. But I start off and I say, okay, how would you like the neck to look? What neckline do you like? So then I draw that in. What kind of a sleeve do you want? Well, short sleeve, long sleeve to the elbow, ruffle, whatever. Um, what kind of a waist do you want? Do you want it high waisted, long waisted? Do you want it to be up? Do you want it to be down? How do you want that? So then I draw that in. Then I draw the length of the skirt. Do you want laces that go vertical? Do you want laces that go horizontal? Uh, and then how do you want the bottom? Do you want a hem? Do you want it to end in lace? Do you want it to end with a ruffle that's got lace on the bottom of it? You know, how do you want, and I draw this whole picture and then I say, what do you like? You know, do you like this or not? And if you don't like something, it's in pencil. I can erase it and we change it and we get what we want. And that's my pattern. So I work strictly from my piece of paper. So then once I get the neckline designed, if I'm going to do embroidery, this is, I don't know if you can see it. This is one that I drew out that's for a V-neck. And so then I draw it out and I um, put it onto the dress and then I stitch it and it's all stitched with single strand. Is it mostly satin stitch that you use? Um, no, it's not satin stitch. It will be outline. It'll be um, little uh, lazy daisy stitches. Can you see that? Uh, yeah. Uh, it'll be bullion rosebuds. Beautiful. And anything, and it'll mimic the neckline of the dress. And this year I have three girls that all graduate from the same place who wanted embroidery. So I had to do different embroidery for each of those dresses so they don't even begin to look alike. Wow. Um, but they all had different necklines. So one is a, a higher rounded neckline, one is a keyhole neckline, and one is a V neckline. So that kind of made it easy to make them all different. But it's, it's, it's fun to do, it's tedious, it's handwork, but I love doing it. <laughs> So I'm a little crazy that way, but that's it. Well, you're very talented. Oh, I think <laughs> they're a lot of fun. Uh, so Margaret, Millicent had a question too. So Millicent, I've, I've turned on your microphone. Did you want to talk? 
Yeah, I want to show off the two, the, 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 the beige corduroy pants I made. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Oh, very nice. nice. Very nice. See that, that right there is a button. <laughs> this is a side. Wow. Oh, wow. Is, right. Here's the, the Velcro. You see the Velcro? Great job, Millicent. <laughs> Great mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. Thank You're you. You're very creative. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. That was wonderful. Thanks. Really appreciate you doing that for us. Sure. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Is everybody making masks? I'm making yes. some. I'm, I don't want, I'm not the kind of person who wants to sew all day, every day. So I'm making some. Yesterday I sewed four for a neighbor. I'd already given her two. And I sewed a baby mask and, and two kids masks and an adult mask. But I'm not fast at it like you, Joyce. I could never get up to four or five an hour. Well, you you'll, know. <laughs> you'll, you'll pick up speed as you should go, but it, it still takes me about 20 minutes for each. Yeah. Um, and so making for the folks around you first is of course the m biggest priority. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you, if you do have some extra capacity, there are nursing homes and so forth that are asking for them. And so we're trying to fulfill the need, but Goddard House needs some. The Brookline Housing Authority has asked for their staff. Uh, the fire and police are now asking. So the demand is growing <laughs> all the time. I was thinking of taking a bunch of them to Roach Brothers because I was in Roach Brothers and none of those cashiers are wearing masks and they, they should be. Yeah, and it would be nice if they had something sort of fun and bright, brightly colored so that they don't feel like they're looking too medicinal, you know. Yeah, that's a good idea. Little, I have sort of lots welcoming. of material. Margaret's been oh, making yeah. funny ones. You showed us some in the beginning, but you had some cute prints, right? Yeah. Um, let me see if I can get the computer over to the table. I'll show you some of the ones I've done. I wish I'd made the baby one out of something colorful. I just made white ones yesterday. Well, they, you, really don't, you really don't need to put them on babies. According to the CDC, it's the adults that are the most uh, problematic, but the children should be staying home anyway. I think they just want to go wear it when they go out for walks. They're not. Oh, look, going there's some. They're not going to the thing. supermarket or anything. Are uh, those face masks? Yes. For yeah, little children. Oh, those are great. For and little children. Very colorful. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, I'm over to my physical therapist yesterday. And um, so my one physical therapist has a wife who's also a therapist in a different place. And so I asked him, I said, is she still seeing patients? Because she does home patients. Um, and uh, he said, oh, yeah, she's still going to homes and doing it. I said, okay. So then I made two this morning for her, and I'll take those over. And my other physical therapist has two young children two and four who are going to daycare every day. Uh -huh. and when I gave her the mask, she said, oh, do you by chance have a child size? And could you make them for the kids that they still have to go to daycare every day? And so I looked online and I found the dimensions for the child size. And so I, that the uh, little ones I made are going to go to, so I'll take Are the child the size a lot smaller or are they pretty much the same with, with shorter ear pieces? Um, the directions I had were a piece of nine by eight with seven inch elastic for the adult and five by seven with six inch elastic for the children. Yeah, I made six inch elastic for the, for the children yesterday yeah. and five and a half for the baby. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I haven't done any baby ones, but. <laughs> I don't know if this baby would wear it or not. I mean, the, the baby's gonna be in a stroller when they go yeah. out for so 
So oh. this is this is the adult <laughs> one, <laughs> and this is the child one that I made. Uh huh. Her little boy loves soccer, so I made soccer. Oh, that's cute. Him. And then her daughter is just a girly girl, and so hers are all pink because <laughs> she likes lots of pink. Okay, thank you. Right. <laughs> but yeah, then they have, and the child one's only had two pleats, where the adult one has three pleats. Right. So. But they're they're done. I've, I've made 68 in the past two days. Wow. Just trying to make for friends and people around. I took them down to the people two doors down and got this lovely thank you note from her because we just kind of put them on the door. And um, she said it just brightened her day. She said, I can't go anywhere, but it just brightened my day to have these. <laughs> so Yeah, uh, that's nice. That's yeah. nice to be in touch with your neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, our son, Curtis, is a Celtic freak uh, basketball. <laughs> So she still has some Celtic fabric. <laughs> yeah, when Very I made good. pajamas for all the boys. No, um, I'm not I a Celtic fan. Play. Excuse me, I'm not a Celtic fan of the brooms or any people like that. <laughs> I'm not a Celtic fan. And I wouldn't you like that material. Any of your favorite much. team. But I had the side pieces from when I had done their pajamas because they were too big to be a doubled over fabric. And so I had the side piece and I thought, oh, that's the perfect size to make these masks. So he has three sons and I have learned long ago, I can't send just three of something. If it's Celtics, I have to send four of it and so <laughs> four Celtic masks and then made them another set of just other things. And then I sent for the girls as well. So got those off in the mail. They're flying around over the country right now. They should be there tomorrow. But great. I washed a, a tea cozy yesterday because it was so filthy. And now it's got all these stains from the water and the batting. And so I'm going to make a new cover for my tea cozy so it will look fresher and still work as a tea cozy. I wasn't using it because it was so filthy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I often get these um, dresses and they've been packed away for years and they have years uh, age spots on them. And so I have to get them clean and you can soak them in OxyClean or uh. you can, um, I use, and it sounds kind of strange, but it's uh, just the basic component of soap. It has no detergent. It has no uh, fragrance. It has no other chemicals in it. And it's called, Orvis, O-R-V-U-S, and it's a horse shampoo. Huh. You know somebody who has horses, they usually will have this, and it comes in big gallon-sized containers. So if you just take a little tiny jar over and say, can I just have a little bit of your horse shampoo? It will last <laughs> a long time. And this uh, one christening dress that I, I have worked on that was made in 1825, um, the woman said, oh, you know, and I told her, you know, that I, I could work on it, but, and she said, well, let me call the Smithsonian and find out what they would do to it first, and then I'll make a decision. So she called the Smithsonian, and they said, you know, well, we would do this, and we would do that, and she said, and I know this sounds a little strange, but we soak it in this shampoo that's actually a horse shampoo. <laughs> So this woman called me back and said, okay, Margaret, fix my dress. <laughs> <laughs> so you I just use a little tiny bit of it. I recommended the same horse shampoo that you did. <laughs> I was and, like, oh, and yeah. by, by the way, I have some Orbis here. If anybody needs some, you can bring oh, a small container. I know one Orbis. person who, who's, who told me his wife has horses, so they probably have this stuff. Yeah, well, and it's kind of, yeah. of a gel. Um, yeah. It's not a pure liquid, but it's a gel liquid. And so I take my finger and I stick it in it and I just kind of coat my finger with the soap and then I run it under lukewarm water into a glass bowl so that I'm sure that I'm not going to have any medical um, metal reaction to the fabric or anything. And so I just run it into this glass bowl of lukewarm water with this nice little bit of soap in it. And then I soak the dress and the, the water will turn brown as it pulls things out of the fabric. So when the water gets brown, I just 
pour it off and I repeat the process and I can soak a dress for a week or more and it's not going to hurt the dress. But as the water discolors, then I simply change out the water and put new water in and, and just keep going until the water comes clear. And that means it's taking out as much as it's going to take out. And so at that point, you've done as the best you can. And usually it gets everything out. Um, but like when I'm doing laces or something, lace repairs and having to put other laces in, I need to know what color is the actual dress. What color am I really working with? Am I gonna work with white? Am I gonna work with off-white? Am I gonna work with an ecru, which is even darker? Um, but you have to get the dress as white as it's gonna be, and then you know what you're working with. So. So great, and so I think we're almost done. Uh, Claire, do you want to lead us to the little song for before we adjourn here? Yes, I think where it's sunny out and we've had some dreary days, how about you are my sunshine, Joy? Very good, very good. <laughs> Are my sunshine, sunshine, make me happy when I'm away. You'll never know, know how much I love you. So don't you take my sunshine away. I love you all. Thank you for Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you so much, Margaret. You're and welcome. Michael will let you know Bye -bye. when he's going to pick up. Okay. Hope to meet Bye. you someday. Yes. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.